Well, good morning, Calvary. So good to see you. Hey, would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Lord, your word says that you know what we need even before we ask. And Lord, there's some of us coming to you here today, and we've got needs, and there are things that we are asking you for. Lord, I sense in my spirit that today you want to fill some people with hope. You want to give us encouragement, and you know every single one of us and what we need from you. And so, Holy Spirit, would you meet us here today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Welcome to those of you that are not only here with us in the Sanctuary and Auditorium 1, but also here with us in Auditorium 2. So many of you there, so glad that you're here. Also, those of you joining us online, maybe you're watching by way of television or the podcast, we are honored that you would take the time to join us. Uh, we took a little break last week as we were in Psalm 20, and the Lord just did something really special. I think in a lot of our lives, my life as well, and so thankful for that. Jumping back into Matthew 7 today, a couple weeks ago, we started a series that we called Built to Last, and we're talking about things that Jesus is going to give to us, some building blocks, some keys in this chapter, how to build a life that's going to stand through the storms of life. And uh, so we're going to look at some of these building blocks. We're going to get to the second one today. So why don't we jump right in, Matthew chapter 7, look at Jesus' own words here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Here it is, right here in the Sermon on the Mount, a passage of Scripture that maybe even if you weren't so familiar with the Bible, still a passage of Scripture that I think a lot of us maybe have heard over the years, Jesus tells us, he's encouraging us to ask for the things that we're looking for in life from God. This isn't new. I mean, we, we saw this when we were in... The Lord's Prayer several weeks ago, he encourages us to ask for our daily bread. He encourages us to ask for his will to be done, for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Last week, we talked about how he tells us to pray for the desires of our heart, that our plans will succeed. I think for all of us, there's things we ask God for. We ask for his protection, his favor, his healing for us and for others, Some of us are asking for significant things in our relationships, maybe to become parents, maybe it's to do well in our exams. We have things we ask for for our family or for our friends or for ourselves. We've got things we, we need from him we're seeking after in our work life, in our spiritual lives. I know for this pastor, I hope you're asking for good things for the church, and and we ask for these things. I've talked to several people, too, who say, you know, I I think about asking God for things, but they just seem like they're such small things that I'm not so sure that he would even care about the things that I feel like I need. Does God care about the things we need? (laughs) You better believe he does. And Jesus right here encourages us. He tells us that we should ask. So here it is, second building block. The first one two weeks ago that we looked at was do not judge or you will be judged. Here's the second one, right back, super simple, Jesus' words. He tells us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And those words are very key. If we're gonna build a life that's gonna survive and thrive in the storms that come to us in life, today, as we look at this passage, we're gonna look at three keys to receiving from God. We're gonna look at three keys to receiving from God from God. Here's the first one. Jesus' own words, super simple. Number one, he tells us to ask. Number one, he tells us to ask. Seems kind of basic, doesn't it? I mean, this is just, it's kind of where we're at. But sometimes it's when we forget the basic things, as simple as just asking something, that we miss out on some of the most important things in life, because we just don't ask. I've had people say to me, well, you know, I was talking to so-and-so, and I think they're mad at me. Why do you think they're mad at you? I don't, I, I just don't know. I says, well, did you ask them? No. Well, then how are you going to know? So somebody says, I think, uh, I think when they said that, it really hurt my feelings. Well, did you tell them that? No, I didn't, I didn't tell them. Well, then how are they supposed to know? Like I had somebody come up to me years ago and they said, I just got to ask you this. I've heard you don't like me. And I was like, Oh, no, I don't, don't like you. I, 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 think you're, I think you're very nice. Yeah, I think you're a very, very nice person. I don't like you. And they said, 
Well, somebody years ago told me that you don't like me. So for all these years, I felt like there was something between us because I was told that you didn't like me. And you know what I said? No, there's, there's no issue here. You know what I wish? I wish that you had... <laughs> oh, we're only talking about one word here, friends. I, 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 I wish that you had <laughs> asked sooner because that would have set our whole relationship free. So basic. But it's so good for us to know there's times when we just need to ask. In fact, let's go back to that passage. Read it with me because it's super simple. Matthew chapter seven, verse seven. Let's read it together. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who receives and the one who finds and to the one who the door will be opened. And I read that as I studied it to get ready for today, and I said to myself, Jesus, you wasted a whole verse. Because what you said in verse seven, you basically just repeated in verse eight. I could have shaved a whole verse off my Bible reading today. If you hadn't been so redundant, do you think he did that on accident? No, why do you repeat something? You, you repeat it for emphasis, because you don't want it to get missed. Let's say you're watching a, a little child and the stove is hot and they go to reach up and touch the burner on the stove. What are you gonna say? Don't touch that, because I don't want you to get burned, and because I don't want you to get burned, don't touch that. Like, you're gonna repeat yourself because you're, you're emphasizing this. And Jesus says, I'm taking two whole verses. I'm, I'm saying the same thing twice, almost the, the, the same concept. He doesn't even really change the words all that much. And he just says, I want you to ask. He's emphasizing it. And then he gets more, I don't know, emphatic and aggressive as he goes, right? He says, first, I want you to ask. And then I want you to seek. That's more active, isn't it? And then he says, then I want you to, then I want you to pound on the door. And I want you to knock. Because he wants us to know that life in his kingdom, when we live the way that he wants us to, life in God's kingdom is active, not passive. We don't just sit back. We actively live the life that he's called us to live. And part of that is that we ask him for the things that we hope to receive from God. Two things we've learned already so far. The first is this, that all of us have things that we need from God. I think for every single one of us, there's something we're asking him for. So like maybe, maybe dial it up in the hard drive of your head right now. What are you asking God for? Well, think about it for a moment. If you, if you were put on the spot and you had to respond in some way, what is it you're asking God for? Because the other thing that Jesus has shown us is that when we live in his kingdom, <laughs> he wants us to ask. So if he wants us to ask, how do we do it? How, how do we go about asking him for those things. Let me give you real quick from scripture, because if we're going to ask, I want us to ask the right way, the way the Bible says it. Real quick, let's look at these things. We'll just call them the biblical art of asking. Like if you're going to ask God for something, how do you do it? Uh, let me give you just a few of these. I think there's five here we'll look at real quick. Here's the first one. Ask before you fight, that you should ask before you fight. What do we mean? Look at this. James chapter four, verse two it says, you desire, but you do not have, and so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. I, I think the King James Version says, you have not because you ask not. And he says, instead of fighting, before you struggle, before you reach out of the way, before you take great effort, have you thought to ask God? So, so maybe the, the picture that comes to my mind as I think about this is, you, you ever been to a, a big family dinner, like a, like a Thanksgiving or a Christmas, or if you've never been to one like this, I'm sure you've seen it on a TV show or a movie, where there's this giant table and all the people are sitting around it. Do you have the picture with me? And all of a sudden you realize the thing you want is on the other side of the table. And so you just decide you're going to go for it. And you just kind of stand up and you just kind of reach and start grabbing and you go after it. Well, there's a few problems with that. Number one, it's rude, isn't it? All the moms in the room. <laughs> like it's rude to do that. Two, you're, you're probably gonna bump into someone. So if you've not already annoyed them, now you have. You're probably gonna spill something. 
You're gonna make a mess. You're gonna upset people. And likely it is that you're not gonna be able to reach what you're going after in the first place. You're gonna irritate people. You're gonna make a mess all for something that could have come your way if only you'd asked. And Jesus tells us to ask, and James tells us that we should ask before we start fighting, before we start reaching, and believe that God is gonna help us in that. So the first one, ask before you fight. Here's the second one, number two, ask for what is right. The very next verse, James says, don't fight. You have not because you ask not. In the very next verse, verse three, he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And he tells us, you can't ask God for things with motives that aren't right and then expect that he'll give it. Like if a child asks for candy before dinner, do they usually get it? Not that there's anything wrong with the candy, praise God. But it's just not the, it's not the right time. Your motive's probably not right in that moment. The, the truth is I've known people who have asked God for things so that once they get blessed in that way, they can impress other people. Or even more, maybe they've asked God for things so that they can get even with other people. Those aren't motives that God can bless. Look at this, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. John tells us this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So what's key in this whole idea of asking and seeking and knocking is that we're asking according to these kind of things in the art of the biblical art of asking. We're asking according to God's will. Ask before you fight. That was the first one that we saw here. The second one was ask for what is right. Here's the third one. Ask as you delight. Do you see the little rhyming going on here? Anybody like Dr. Seuss? Do you see the rhyming? Here's where we're talking about this. Ask as you delight. Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We even saw this from Psalm 20 last week, that we can pray and ask for God to give us the desires of our heart. It's it's a part of what he wants as he blesses us. But let me just encourage you, we can't just ask and ask and ask and never consider the source. Some of us just want and want and want and forget that God is our source. And it says here that our asking and our receiving starts with our delighting in who he is. If all we ever want is just our desires to be met, then we miss out on the, the bigger picture of what God wants to do. Let, let, me, let me make this a little bit, uh, maybe kind of from a different vantage point. I see this a lot in relationships with couples, that what happens oftentimes over time in marriages is that what started out as kind of that deep honeymoon love relationship ends up deteriorating to the point that so much of the relationship is just about what you can get from the other person. The emotional needs, physical needs, material needs, your whole relationship becomes more what you can get from the other person than it does about the relationship that you started out with in the first place. You, you wanna put a little spark back in your marriage? Start loving that other person for who they are, for that closeness, for that relationship, to delight in them, and not just for the things that they bring to the relationship. And what I find is when I get my selfishness out of the way, it makes that relationship so much richer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, the exact same is true in in our relationship with God. So many times we go to God and we want just what we think we want, but when we start with delighting in him, knowing who he is, Loving him for his greatness and his love and his presence and the peace and who he is in our lives for what he's done. When we see him in our majesty, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, not only is our heart then in line to ask for his will, but then he's in a place where he can give us the desires of our heart. But if I'm just asking out of selfishness, I'm missing missing the whole point. So I need to ask as I delight in him, let's hit two other ones just real quick. Not only all those we've talked about, but ask with all your might. But don't just ask halfway. Here's an example. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it'll be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person 
should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So James says, if you truly are asking God for something, ask and believe. Ask with all your might. Last one, ask and then do right. Ask and then do right. Here, here's what John tells us again. First John chapter 3, dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. You can't expect to receive from God when you ask if he knows you're not going to do the things that he wants for you to do. So, so real quick, five, five things that were in the biblical art of asking. Ask before you fight. Ask for what is right. Ask as you delight. Ask with all your might. Ask and then do right. <laughs> Cheesy, huh? Cheesy. But I hope one of them stuck with you. Because I want you to ask and receive. But you can't expect to ask and receive if you don't ask according to his word. But, but are you sure? Are you sure, Chad, that he wants me to ask? Well, we're doing it as a church. Like, we're, we're asking God that he would help us to give more to missions this year than we have in many, many, many years. Our goal is to give about $435,000 through the church to help bless other ministries and missionaries all around the world. Let me give you one example. Over the course of the next two weeks, we're going to ask you to ask God what he would have you to do for one of our projects. We have multiple projects this year. You can pick up one of the Love the World booklets either out in the hallway or, or in the hub or around the building. And one of our projects this year is to help fund a translation in Northern Asia of the Fire Bible. If you're not familiar with the Fire Bible, I'd encourage you, get one. It is an awesome tool that is a, a study Bible that can help you not only read God's word, but then understand what you're reading. It was originally designed as a tool for pastors in very, very remote places who couldn't get biblical training to have a resource to be able to teach the people in their churches how to understand and, and know God's word for themselves. It's an incredible tool, but there's so many parts of the world where you have pastors in remote places who don't have the tool because it's not been translated into their language, and we as a church want to do something to fix that. And so we have partnered with the Fire Bible. you hear more about this next week. And we're asking God to help us as a church fund one of those translations so that pastors in a very remote part of Asia can go and give the good news to people who need to hear it. I think that's something God wants us to ask for, isn't it? So would you ask God what he would have for you to do? Now, that's what we're asking for as a church. What are you asking for? Like, what is it that comes to your mind right away where you say, God, I'm asking you for? Can I tell you, even in my own life, like, it's, it's not that I'm praying different, but I'm asking different. Like, I'm asking with a boldness. In fact, lately, I've, I've just been kind of opening my mouth more and just flat out with my voice asking God for things. And guess what? <laughs> I'm seeing some of it. And there's these moments where you see God work in your life, and then you know, God, you did that, and part of why you did that is because I asked for it. Do you know what we've asked for as a church? We've asked as a church that more and more people would come to know Jesus and surrender their lives to him. You know the best thing that happened to me today? I set my Bible down over there on that chair, and when I went to preach, the, the front of my iPad was all wet because it was in the splash zone. I'd like to see more Splash Zone Sundays, wouldn't you? So we ask God for those things. I don't know, Ted, that's cool. We're asking for missions and asking for people to find Jesus. What about my stuff? John 15, 16. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. He has a purpose for your life, fruit that will last. And so that... Whatever you, help me here, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. He wants you to come to him. He wants to meet your needs. Know this, God wants you to ask. He's asking you to ask. He's telling you to ask. So ask and do what he said. So let's go back to the text. I, I love it because this is a familiar passage. I love it and it helps me. Let, let's read this together, Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who receives and the one who finds and to the one who the door will be open. If the first thing that we talked about today was to ask, if that was number one, anybody got to guess what number two is? Seek. Here's the second thing. You want a key to receiving from God, number two, it's to seek. Before we talk about this a little more, let me give you just one quick thought. If you're going to seek, then seek with all your heart. Don't go into this thing halfway. If you're going to seek, believe that you're going to find. The Bible says this, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When I was in the second grade, my math grade started to really go down. And the teacher came to me one day and she said, Chad, you can't see the blackboard, can you? Does anybody remember blackboards? Makes me want to sneeze just thinking about it. And, and I couldn't, I said, no, I can't, I couldn't see it. So they realized I needed glasses. So my eyes have progressively gotten worse and worse and worse over the years. But when I was in junior high, I started wearing contact lenses. Who are my contact people in the house? Any of you, like, I think it's always, because we're just trying to be secret about it. Some of you won't even raise your hand. You're like, he doesn't need to know. <laughs> and... Um, in, in junior high, I started wearing these. I, I, I tried the soft lenses at one point in my life. They just didn't work. I wear these like hard gas permeable contact lenses. They're like these little plastic discs that I just pop in my eye, and every night I pop them out, and I have to clean them. And it's just, it's just, but it works. They're good for my eyes. They work well. So that's just. So I wear these little contact lenses. So every every morning I got to put them in. Every night I got to pop them out, and I got to clean them and do all this. And every so often, when I pop them out, I drop them, and then I look for them. And when I look, drop them, and I look for them, I don't just go, eh, whatever. If I find it, great. If I don't, no big deal. Because every one of those, if I have to replace them, is 100 bucks a pop, right? So, so I don't want to lose them on a regular basis. In fact, I'd prefer not to lose them at all. So the other day, I dropped one, and I don't stand there and go, eh, never mind. No, I just start seeing dollar signs in my head, and you know what I do? I start looking. Inevitably, I take my phone out. And I take the flashlight and I start looking around and I get down on the floor in the bathroom and I'm looking all over and I look for that thing. The other day I was looking for one and all of a sudden the cat came walking in. I cast that thing out in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Last thing I need is a cat walking around my house with $100 between its paws. No way. Get out of here. Like when I look for one of those, I don't do it halfway. I seek it with all my, my heart, because I, I, it has value to me. Like, if you're seeking something from the Lord, the Bible says don't do it halfway. You, you seek him with all your heart. All right, thanks, Chad. And I did, and I didn't find it. And I asked, and I didn't receive it. So now what am I supposed to do? Because I did exactly what Jesus said. And I asked him, and I sought for the things I wanted from him, but I haven't found them. So now what do I do? So we, we've already read Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask, be given, you seek, find the, the, the redundancy there. And then Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread... We'll give him a stone. Unless it's like a little prank, no good parent is going to do that. Right? If the child needs nourishment, you're, you're going to feed them. You're not going to give them stone when they ask for bread. Look at verse 10. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. We, we've gone from useless bread to poisonous snake. Right? If your child needs fish, you're not going to give them something that is going to kill them. Jesus says in verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Like, if you're a parent, you, you know this. If your child asks for something, I wouldn't have believed this before I was a dad. But once I became a dad, there's something that changes in your heart. Anything that, that they need I'll do my best to provide that for them when they ask. And I love my kids, but I would walk right past them for my grandson. 
true grandparents? This, I can't get it. I don't understand it. He says, if you're like that, if that's how you are, think of how your heavenly father is. He says you're evil, not, not because he's calling you out, because he's saying your motives aren't always right. But you have a heavenly father who's holy and perfect, and he never changes. I thought, why, why would Jesus say this? I, in my mind, oftentimes when I read scripture, I picture the people that Jesus is talking to almost in like a, like a fairy tale, kind of perfect kind of way, and I forget what their lives were really like. When Jesus said this in the first century, he was talking to Jewish people who had been asking and seeking for centuries. They were under the oppression of the Roman government. They didn't have freedom. They were being mistreated. There were so many things that weren't fair. For centuries, the Jewish people were saying, God sent us a redeemer. God sent someone to rescue us. God, would you help us? They had asked and they had sought and they hadn't received yet. They hadn't found yet. On top of that, and Jesus has already told us this throughout the Sermon on the Mount, they're living in a world that's run by hypocrites. And they've got all these people telling them how they're supposed to live and telling them what they're supposed to do. And I realize when Jesus starts talking to them about asking God for something, there were a lot of them who were passive and they were defeated and apathetic. They'd started to conform to their culture and they were frustrated and deceived and mistaken and confused about the things they were asking God for. And they were just flat out faithless, so many of them, because of what they'd been through, because they had sought and they didn't find. And Jesus said, when you sought and you didn't find, when you ask and you did not receive, don't start to think that because the system is corrupt or people have done you wrong or you've been disappointed by the church, that somehow God's not there. Because your good heavenly father knows exactly how to give you what you need, when you need it, in the way that you need it, so that he can bless your life. Now, why do I stress that? (laughs) Because just like those folks in the first century, some of us have a hard time asking because we have a hard time trusting because that parent disappointed us or that boss mistreated you or a spouse hurt you, or a child wounded you, or a friend betrayed you, or the church frustrated you. And now you have a hard time asking because you're not so sure if you asked if it would make any difference anyway at all. Whatever you believed in the past, I want you to know that there is a good father who hears you when you ask. So much so, look at this. Um, I want you to know that you're seeking good things from a good heavenly father. Sometimes that's hard for us to believe, but you are seeking good things from a good heavenly father. Let me give you some Bible to kind of back that up. Romans chapter eight, verse 28 says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for the good of those who love him. God works for the good of those who love him. This is, I'm asking for, for everybody to help me out here. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that, that verse. In this room, auditorium two, you're watching on a screen, someone raise your hand. Yeah, we, we not only have heard that verse, have you ever had somebody quote it to you? Like you're going through a hard time and they go, oh, God works all things together. You stub your toe. And they're like, God works all things together. And you're like, well, go stub your toe then, and I'll say it to you. Because when you're the one hurting, sometimes that verse has become a little cliche. That when you're going through a hard time, somebody just says, well, God works all things together. Do you know why the verse is cliche? (laughs) Because we say it so much. And why do we say it so much? Because it's true that God does work all things together. But we have to ask, why did Paul even say it in the first place? Like, why, why did this iconic verse even come up, sometimes we just quote it because we heard it in a sermon or we saw it on a poster or we put it on our wall somewhere. But remember what he said just before this, before Paul says, God works all things together in Romans 8, 28, he says this in Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. Do you know why he was saying this? Because he was telling them about how broken the world is. He was talking to them about how messed up the world is, and how much we need someone to come and rescue us. And he says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself 
intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Why does Paul say that all things work together for good? Because just before he said it, that a God who loves you is actually praying for you. He's not just working it out for you, but the spirit you seek is interceding for you. So he's praying for you. God is watching you. And when you're going through these moments when you're asking and you're seeking and you're not finding and you're trying to believe that God is still good, remember this, that even in those moments, God is actively himself seeking to bring to you the best for you in your life, even when you don't understand it. When I was in my early 20s, before God gave us the opportunity to come and serve here at Calvary. There were two jobs that I really wanted. Like in, in, in church world, there were two, these two times that, man, I wanted those jobs. And so I applied for them, one I even interviewed for. Like I just thought, God, I'm pretty sure this is, this is, this is what you have for us. This is where you're leading. And I, I just wanted those jobs. One of them was because I just thought it would be such a cool opportunity. I knew the people. It was a place I wanted to serve. I really just thought that. The other was probably more of a season of probably just ego and frustration on my part. But, but both of those times, it was like, man, I just, I, this is what I want. And both of those times, it was a no. And I thought for sure we were going in that direction. And then your mind starts going in different ways. Like, the one I just remember thinking, boy, did they miss out. <laughs> you ever thought that? <laughs> like, man, I just, I just thought that wasn't. The other one, you just kind of like, so do I not have what it takes? Am I not good enough? And I've got plenty of years now to look back on those experiences that honestly were, were painful and defeating when I look back and I think, God, I just I didn't understand it in those moments because it's not that I wasn't praying. I was asking and seeking through that whole time. I was, God, I want to do your will. God, I want to be in the right place. I look back now and I can tell you two things. One is this. I'm almost, I'm almost 100% certain that if we had landed in those spots, our family would not be as healthy and as happy as it is today if we had ended up there. In fact, I'm not even sure I'd still be doing what I'm doing today if I had ended up in either of those spots. The second thing is this. One of the greatest gifts God ever gave to us was to be a part of what God's doing here at Calvary, and that would not have happened if I had got what I was seeking for. But the Holy Spirit that whole time was at work, and God was saying, all things are gonna work out for your good, so keep asking and keep seeking which takes us back to Matthew 7. One one more time, read this whole passage out loud with me if you would. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who receives and the one who finds and to the one who the door will be opened. Three keys to receiving from God. Number one, you ask. Number two, you seek. Pop quiz. Number three, of course, is (laughs) you knock. Number three is knock. And can I tell you, when you knock, don't stop knocking. Don't just give one of these. Like there's times when you just got to keep knocking and don't stop knocking and persist and keep knocking because you believe that on the other side of that door, someone is gonna answer. And don't stop when there's no answer. Well, why does God sometimes not answer? Sometimes it's not the right time for the door to open. And sometimes you're knocking and you're still closing it shut with the other hand. (laughs) And sometimes when that door does open, the thing that's there is not what we expected to see. And so we close the door again and start knocking some more. Sometimes we've just got to realize that in those moments, you just have to keep knocking. Last, Last year, probably late summer, early fall, it was just a beautiful night and I had left the office a little later and I I got home and Rhonda was uh, working with a team of some people to plan for an event here at the church and so they were were meeting at our house and it was all ladies and I knew I wasn't invited (laughs) and it was probably too much for me anyways. So I pulled in the driveway and I looked at the house and I said, it's really nice out here, I think I'll go for a walk. So I decided to go for a walk and I looked and my neighbor was, was walking down the street, he goes for a walk every evening. And I said, hey, are you out for your walk? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, can I, can I walk with you? And he said, that'd be great. He says, actually, I want to you know, meet, introduce somebody to you. And so we, we start walking. We go around the corner and we start walking. All of a sudden, he just starts walking through somebody's odd driveway or yard, just starts walking through the yard. 
And I was like, hey, you can't just, you can't just walk through the yard like this. We're, we're going to get arrested. And he basically was like, settle down. And so then we walked up to the house, and he gave it a knock, and nobody came. And then he gave it a good pound, and nobody came. Knocked some more. Nobody came. And I was kind of like, guess they're not home. And he said, maybe they're in the kitchen. So we walked around to the back of the house. He starts banging on the window. And I'm just kind of looking around, seeing if any neighbors are out there while we're trying to break into somebody's house. And he starts knocking on the window and he starts yelling, hey, hey. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? And I just, I thought, I don't want to get arrested. Maybe I'll just go hide in a bush and watch him get arrested. That's what I was thinking. And, and then he said, maybe, maybe she's in the living room. And I'm like, are you, he's got the floor plan of the house memorized in his head. Goes around the side of the house, starts banging on the window. Hey, hey, just kind of yelling. And I'm, what in the world's going on? And finally we walk away back towards the, towards the other side of the house. And then inside of the house, I start hearing, who is it? Who is it? And I'm like, she's yelling for you. And he's yelling, hey. And she's yelling, who is it? And like, we finally go around, knock on the door again. She opens the door. And he, he had to give her something. We have a conversation. I meet the neighbor now and all this kind of stuff. And it's, and it's like, I was so uncomfortable. It was far too long. I was sure I was going to have to call Rhonda or Pastor Keith or somebody to come bail me out of somewhere. But the door opened because my very wise friend knew that in there, was what he was asking and seeking and knocking for. So he kept knocking. Now, the person that lived inside of that house didn't hear very well. <laughs> you know God's not hard of hearing, right? But sometimes you just have to keep knocking. And don't stop when you don't get an answer. I was with some friends this week who for years and years said, we believe God wants us to be parents. And yet no baby, and no baby, and watching other people have babies, and no baby, and no baby, and praying and asking and saying, God, we, we're asking you to bless us. And no baby, and no baby. And this week I got to meet their baby one that we have as a family, often that many of you as the church also have been praying for. And I asked little Stratton's mom, I, I said, tell me about your experience. And she said, God's timing is perfect. And in those tough moments, you follow his direction and know that his truth is more important than your feelings and that God is a God of miracles and that he hears our prayers and that he's working in our lives, and even in the times when you're terrified and sad and confused and hopeless, you hold on to him. Because when that door gets opened, his rewards are so much better than what you could have asked or imagined for. And some of you are knocking on that door. And, and many times I think we knock the loudest and the hardest as parents for children. And some of you are pounding on a door for children to be born and I know many of you as parents are pounding on a door for your children to be born again. And you're knocking. And you're believing. Keep knocking. And don't stop when there is no answer. And please, please, please don't stop when you feel stuck. Because there will be moments when you've knocked and you'll think the door's not open. So I'm just stuck here. This is just where I'm at and it's never gonna change, and this is just where I'm gonna be. I've, I was talking with a friend this week, and they were telling me about the situation that their life's in right now, and it's really bad. It's a really tough situation. And we were talking, and I know they have to navigate this, and as we were just kind of sharing with each other, I felt like the Lord just kind of put in my heart to read Psalm 23, Classic passage of scripture. Another cliche, isn't it? <laughs> and then we, we started reading it, and we got to that verse that says, well, you, you know it. It's Psalm 23, verse 4, that says, even though I walk, the NIV says, through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The English Standard Version is a little more familiar, where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And when we read that verse, I felt in my heart to look at her and say this. And then when I was writing this sermon, I felt that I was supposed to look at you and say it. You are not stuck here. Like some of you feel like, I'm just stuck in this place. And God says, no, I see something on the other side for you. He does not say, even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death and build a house here and I will stay stuck in this valley, I will fear no evil. What does he say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it doesn't mean you don't walk through it. It doesn't mean it's not dark. It doesn't mean it's not difficult. It doesn't mean you won't knock and wait for an answer. But it means you don't give up when you're stuck because you're gonna get on the other side of this thing. And the door is going to open because he said it would. And we trust him in this, and we put our confidence in him in this, and we believe in him in this. And and what I'm not saying to you is what sometimes they call a prosperity gospel. You ever heard of that? That if you just say it the right way, or you just say it enough, and you just put enough Harry Potter on it, then God's got to do it. That's not the Bible, and that's not the gospel, and God is not manipulated, And that's why we talk about the the biblical art of asking, but he does say this, that if you ask, you will receive, and if you seek, you will find, and if you knock, even when you get no answer, and even when you feel stuck, you keep knocking, and that door will be open. Don't build your house there. You're gonna get through that valley, the valley of your grief, in the valley of your disappointment, in the valley of your waiting, in the valley of your broken heart, you keep knocking and believe that the Holy Spirit's gonna be there with you because that's what Jesus said he would do. Can I, can I give you one more knocking scripture before we, we wrap up? This one puts a little different twist on it. This is Jesus talking as well, but it's not in Matthew. It's in Revelation chapter three. And Jesus says this, he says, look, behold, hey you, I stand at the door and, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. I'll come in with you and you'll be with me and I'll be with you. This this is a beautiful picture from the first century of what fellowship is like, of what connection is like, of what relationship is like. And Jesus says, hey, I'm standing here and I'm knocking and I'm waiting on you to open the door. See, there are times when we're knocking and we're pounding and God says, I'm just waiting on you to open up your heart. I'm waiting on you to trust me. Just remember this. Remember the key is sometimes on your side of the door. Sometimes we just have to open up and just say, God, I surrender this situation. I surrender my life to you. And that you don't give up in those moments. And that you trust in him. And can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for for just a moment? Because before we get to the, the last thought, there's some of you in auditorium too, and there's some of you sitting here in this room, and there's some of you listening to a podcast or watching this on TV or you're streaming this right now. And you, you can hear Jesus knocking on the, we'll call it the door of your heart. And he's saying, I'm here. And I want to give you the desires of your heart. And I want your plans to succeed but you have to open the door of your heart to me. And some of you would say, Chad, I I need a whole lot more than just to receive. My my life is, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I can't do it on my own. And there's no better time than right now, no better time than today to say, Jesus, I open the door of my heart to you. I give you my life. You see, Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could know forgiveness. He's our savior. And he rose on the third day and he's alive today to give you purpose and meaning to fulfill your life. And finding that fulfillment, finding that purpose and finding that meaning simply starts by saying, Jesus, I give you my life. I open up the door to you. And if you hear him knocking today, 
and you would say, Jesus, I open up the door of my life to you. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? Look, that's you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. Anybody else? Thanks. You're in this room. You're watching on a screen somewhere. Just raise your hand. Jesus, I open up the door of my life to you. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Thank you. If you know that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, or if today you've, you've, you've made a promise to, to open up the door of your heart to him, would you loud and proud pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus, for sending your son to die for my sin. I ask today that you would forgive my sin and be my savior. I give my life to you, my risen Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, look, if you, if you raised your hand or if you prayed that prayer, especially for the first time, you have begun a step of opening your heart to what God wants to do in your life. Following the service, both in this room and in Auditorium 2, we'll have friends down at the front who would love the opportunity to pray with you. We have a Bible we want to give to you and encourage you in your decision to follow Jesus. If you're watching online or television, you can go out to our website at toledocalvary.org. There's a link there that you can click that allows us to maybe get some more information your way or pray with you about following Jesus. And church, over the course of the last few weeks, we've been getting emails from people who have been watching online and watching on television and making a decision to follow Jesus. And I think we should celebrate that today. <laughs> Team's gonna come and lead us in a song that says, God, I'm calling on you. It says, God, I need you. And there's probably no better way for us to respond on a day when we're asking and seeking and knocking. In fact, I don't want to put anybody in an awkward spot. But if you would say, God, thank you. I need an encouragement today. If you're in a place where you're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking, would you just stand right where you are? We want to pray for you. I think sometimes it's just a step of faith, right? Just right where you are, you would say, God, I, you know what I'm asking for. You know what I'm seeking you for. You know the door I'm pounding on. And that's you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're going to pray with you today. We're going to pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you are a God who keeps his word. So, Lord, would you help us as we ask and seek and knock and put our trust in you? Church, would you stand? Let's stand together and let's sing this song of faith today.
remain the same. You are the same God. So, Father, we hold on to your word. And God, right now today, I, I believe that you are bringing encouragement and you're bringing your grace to some people. You're, you're filling some hearts with joy who have been knocking for a long time. And you are encouraging those who have been seeking. And God, we believe that you're going to help those who are asking to receive because you're a God who keeps his word. And so, Lord, we... We ask and we seek and we knock from a good, good, good heavenly father as we put our trust in you. Lord, as we go from here, would you send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank our good father today for his word? Hey, Calvary, thanks so much for being here. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.